hit record. Hey, Vibo, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Excellent. All right. Uh, should we get started? Uh, yeah. All right. So why don't you uh, quickly summarize what uh, were your key takeaways in the last three sessions or from the last I mean, sessions? some of the stuff we talked about in the past few sessions is like compound interest and how like if you invest like early, right, it builds up a lot over time because due to compounding. Another thing we talk about is like potential like obstacles such as envy, debt, and jealousy and all, and procrastination. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also talked about like investing and the return on interest and like the different kind of things you could invest in like bonds, stocks, and all of those. Yeah, yeah. So pretty much uh, it. And then, um, you know, the best investment one can make is uh, to invest in uh, oneself or invest in yourself. Right. Right. So what we will do today, uh, probably I would say today is going to be the core. And that's why I named it as uh, the core. And we will look at uh, indexing and what indexing means and uh, why is it so effective. So we'll be spending uh, the entire time on that. Make sense? Yep. All right, I'll be switching back and forth between presentation mode and regular mode. Uh, so I'm entering presentation mode now. Mm -hmm. All right, so the first thing uh, is what does product, uh, how does productivity go up? So I'm going to give an example. I came across this example in a book called as uh, Bitcoin Standard. Uh, it's going to be very relevant for today's discussion. So you see two people on the, on the slide. One person is Harry, another person is Linda. And we are talking about, uh, say, you know, 10,000 years ago. Uh, so Harry, uh, both of them uh, earn their living or uh, eat their food by catching fish. So Harry can catch eight fishes in, uh, in, in eight hours of fishing. So he fishes eight hours every day. So every hour he catches a fish and he, he catches eight fishes and he consumes it all. Okay. And that's what Harry does every day. It doesn't matter whether it is Sunday or Monday. He does it across, um, you know, 365 days a year. He, he does that. Now, Linda, on the other hand, uh, she spends six hours every day fishing and she can catch six fishes because they have to catch fish by hand. So she does that. So unlike Harry, she cannot eat eight fishes every day. She decides to eat only six, but she still has two hours because she's not working for eight. Remember, she works for six. So what she does is she is investing that two hours in building a net. So she believes that building a net would help her catch more fishes in less time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what Linda is doing is she is foregoing consumption today in the hope of consuming more in the future by putting in less effort. All right. Now let's right. pretend that Linda is successful. Uh, in making a net. Now, Linda can catch eight fishes. Let's take in half the time of has Harry, right? So Linda can catch eight fishes in four hours. Now, how much time Linda has in her spare hands? I mean, uh, has spare uh, more to do something else? Uh, she still has four hours left, right? Exactly. Yeah. So Linda can use that four hours to go and maybe make a boat or maybe build other equipments that would help her to catch more fishes. Maybe she can go deeper in the river and catch better fishes, which Harry cannot, because remember he is catching it uh, using his hand. He can only go up to a certain extent in the river. So the example that I have given is, is what productivity is all about. Productivity is nothing but uh, you investing time and energy in building things that would make life better in the future, maybe in the near future or maybe in the far away in the future or in the mid future. So that's what Linda has done. Uh, so the term for this is called as time preference. The lower your time preference is, the more you're investing in the future. So the way to think about time preference is this. You calculate time preference by uh, saying the value of the present divided by the value you're going to get in the future. Now for Harry, he is putting all the value in the present, which means his numerator is very, very high. He doesn't value future that much. So the denominator is very, very low. So Harry's time preference is very high, which means he's not going to spend time investing in the future. All he does is catching fish today. Unlike mm -hmm. Harry, Linda, 
she values future a lot more because remember the formula is value in the present divided by value in the future so time preference for linda is uh, much lesser that makes her to invest in the future so the biggest thing where productivity comes from are from people who can delay gratification they are saying like look i'm not going to indulge and have everything today i'm going to get as much as i can but i'm going to spend some time to think about the future and build things that's going to make my life and people around me much much better now what do you think descendants of harry would be doing how many hours would they need to fish if they continue fishing by hand um i mean wouldn't they have to continue the 8 hours if they continue exactly. doing by hand exactly what about linda and her descendants uh since they have the boat and the net it would yeah. probably still be four four and it'll come down because imagine she gets a boat she gets better equipment maybe she might fish uh, for a week she can catch all she needs in an hour for a week so that's how productivity goes up and this is the essence of uh, how productivity in the us and across the world has gone up the ability to delay gratification ability to invest in the future the technical term for that is investing in capital goods so when you come across the word capital goods think about this linda and harry example the things you own right capital yeah well it's for like, the business for the business exactly for not not just for today but you're building it for the future mm -hmm. makes sense yeah okay all right moving along now uh this is the per capita gdp remember gdp is what a country produces uh in 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 right. a year and this mm -hmm. is uh, per capita that is what the per person in the us has produced over the last 60 years so in 1960 this number used to be $3000 in 2019 i have this chart till 2019 it is $65000 per capita gdp or in other words productivity has gone up by 5.3% of course there's inflation embedded in this figure but the point that i'm trying to emphasize is unless people have been like linda this would not have happened yeah right and the mm -hmm. beauty is this did the number of hours go up in 2020 compared to 1960 no it's the same 24 hours right yeah uh huh and it's going to be the same 24 hours 100 years from now or 1000 years from now, unless we change the way in how we count numbers time is right. going to come and more mm -hmm. right what has happened is for the same unit of time more goods and services has been produced in the us economy and this is true pretty much across most parts of the planet i would say and this is the crux of productivity going up and you can see it in per capita gdp you just randomly pick a country and uh, check their per capita gdp in the last 40 50 60 years more likely than not you will find it going up remember per capita just for population growth so i'm not re counting real gdp i mean uh, the total dollars here i'm taking per capita gdp questions uh yeah wait so you're saying um like if you graph the per capita for like any country most likely would have went up in the past 60 years right yes yes yeah but if like the total gdp has been going down for the past 60 years wouldn't that also mean the per capita would go down cuz like if you divide if you yeah, find like 100 oh, yeah yeah, oh, yeah, yeah that's what i meant but oh, imagine okay. there were 100 people in the country mm -hmm. they produced 100 dollars tomorrow let's take there are 200 people in the country and they produce 200 dollars oh yeah i the mean per capita yeah, is still one right oh like that all right yeah that's what i meant yeah that's a good question yeah that's what i meant all right i mean this is kind of unrelated but look at this graph you could kind of tell where like the 2009 crash happened yeah exactly it's kind of obvious yeah exactly and i don't think uh, well in 20 i mean i don't think it captures 2020 uh, mm -hmm. or if it is maybe there should be a little blip there as well oh yeah yeah uh, that makes sense 19 yeah uh, cool so now the question that we need to ask is how do we get a fair share of this productivity or in other words how do i participate in this productivity growth where see i i want to pair with people like linda and not people like harry as much as as possible so the question is how can we do that uh, so that comes to the next slide 
so you must own equities or you must own equity to gain your financial freedom so this comes from a person uh, by name uh, his name is nival ravikant he's an entrepreneur and he is the co-founder and the chairman of a company called as uh, uh, angel angel list so what this company does or it's a platform that helps startups uh, to raise funds and it helps startups to hire so this guy built this platform and uh, recently or maybe a year or two or three back he uh, wrote an excellent article or a tweet a tweet storm you know what a tweet storm is right you mean like a thread kind of yeah it's a tweet or thread on how to get rich so in it he talks about uh, you are not going to get rich renting out your time you must own equity a piece of business to gain your financial freedom all i'm trying to say is i'm just connecting this to the productivity growth that happened in the us and uh, what linda did uh, i mean it's a hypothetical example so you must own equities remember if you get paid by the hour let's take you know every hour you are going to get paid some fixed dollars it's very hard for you to scale why because you're still going the amount of money you earn won't change for some time you're yeah. still going to earn like the x amount of dollars per hour exactly and the number of hours is limited per day mm-hmm. right now for for me to uh, gain my financial freedom the only possible way is to own a piece of business it could be your own business or you own an equity uh, in a public company or in any company for that matter so that you get a fair share a share of the productivity growth so you want to participate in that productivity growth so that you get your fair share and the only way to do that is by owning equities any questions uh none so far okay now the next obvious question will be how many business should we own should i own one company should i own 10 should i own 100 should i own 1000 what do you think i mean i think you should have like a like a variation of like businesses like in like when you mean own like the stocks yeah it could be stocks yeah, yeah. okay yeah. Okay I mean I'd say like have it varied so if like some of them stuff like if me on I mean on there's probably like no exact answer but yeah, they probably have it like varied in different it, industries Exactly I think that's the right answer so there's no right answer is the right answer to this question so you know there are people who just owned a, a single business and became insanely wealthy because they added value people like uh, Jeff Bezos or people like bill gates people like elon musk uh, they pretty much owned one or two businesses i would say uh, and i would say most of their wealth came from a single business and you have people like warren buffett uh, he did not own a company he owned many companies when i say many handful of them made money but still that is greater than one uh, and there is another way which is to own more than 100 or 200 or 1000 companies and that is what we would we will be talking about today which is in the form of index funds now for you or for any person you can do all you can have your own business so which means you will have an equity ownership in your own business you might come across a company or two or three that you might really like you might buy uh, a part ownership in that it could be a public company or it could be a private company it doesn't matter and you can also own uh, index funds so pretty much you don't need to say oh this is the only thing that i'm going to do if you get to that conclusion uh, thoughtfully that's perfectly fine so that's why i put the slide here i'm not saying oh you should own one or 10 or 100 or 1000 it's just see what works best for you and you can tune it according make sense yeah all right now let's go to the next interesting slide so these are now i'm going to stick to index funds for the rest of the discussions so these are the top 10 companies from s&p 500 uh, remember s&p 500 uh, is an index which holds 500 companies actually if you look at the number of companies now it would say 505 i guess the reason for that is uh, google has uh, multiple class shares or any company that has more than one class of shares a class of share means what is your voting right how many votes you can uh, put to nominate uh, the board of directors so that's why it would show it as 505 but underlying businesses it has 500 businesses now these are the top 10 companies uh, in 80s 1980 1990 2000 2010 and the 2021 in the current snapshot 
how many so i have a question maybe i'll ask a few questions to you how many mm-hmm. companies in 1980s are present in 2021 um yeah i don't see at&t there um so first yeah none none that's right there's none okay what kind of companies do you see in 1980s dominating oil companies exactly how many oil companies are there uh exxon's oil company right uh, okay so two how about um the the, the german sounding one schlumberger yeah, schlumberger i don't i don't think so i think right, that's not yeah shell is mobile is yeah. because exxon mobil they merged it's exxon mobil standard oil of california is that and atlantic which field is also an oil company yeah so pretty much it's made out of oil company and what, the electricity is similar to oil like it's like yeah, kind of yeah mm-hmm. yeah and what do you, what do you see in 2021 what kind of companies dominate um most of them are tech companies except for like three of them which which three a uh, berkshire chase and johnson and johnson yeah yeah you're right okay now let me ask a uh, next question to you which is say let's take on the 1st january of 1980 okay mm-hmm. you are buying index funds i mean you had 10000 dollars you are going to put it in an index funds which contains 500 stocks but the top 10 dominates a lot usually okay yeah which means your top 10 is what you see uh, over here in 1980 now right. imagine that you put the money 10000 and you completely forgot about it on 1st january 2021 you remember oh my god 40 years back i did the uh, put my money and i'm going to check how much would that be worth what do you think the value of that will be remember take into consideration none of the top companies are not even there in the top 10 right But how much would that 10000 has gone up by I mean um as the years go by would like your the shares in the individual like companies change or is it like fixed like you have like like whatever the landscape of America was in 1980 like the shares would it be static like that until 2021 or will it change as the top companies change yeah no that's a very good question so which it it will change that's what indexes do so the way oh, okay that- then yeah it would probably increase it will increase right can you guess how much would have would it have increased by like 10000 how much would it had become uh it's a guess i mean yeah i know 50000 okay that's a good guess okay 50000 let's uh, stay on it for a bit now let me explain what an index fund do so basically they just buy a basket of 500 right mm-hmm. they put it in there uh index funds have a have and then the way in which they are going to distribute this dollars amongst 500 companies is going to be weighted by market cap right mm-hmm. uh, you know what a market cap is just like how much the company's worth yeah yeah that's pretty much it uh so basically if a company has 100 shares outstanding and if each share is selling for a dollar the market cap is number of shares outstanding times uh, per share value which is 100 times 1 dollar what do you mean is... by outstanding shares like shares that they still need to sell or total shares so these are the think about it as total shares oh total shares yeah. all right oh yeah that makes sense yeah so that's what it is so they distributed by uh, market cap weighted that is let's take if the index had two companies one company's market cap is $70 another company's market cap is $30 now if i have to put $100 the first company will receive $70 and the second company will receive $30 okay mm-hmm. now what happens over the years uh, some of these companies might go bankrupt or they might not meet the criteria to be in the index so they get removed right yeah those things will be redistributed to uh the 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 remaining companies again market cap weighted okay right so this process continues where companies that are winning just by nature its value will grow in the index right okay? companies that are shrinking just by nature the value will go down so pretty much you don't do anything it is just reflecting because of the process you would just in 2021 you wake up 
on the 1st Jan 2021 morning, you would find your top 10 will be this, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, right. Now let's ask, answer the question that I asked. Uh, so each dollar in the portfolio would have grown to $84. I think I looked at the numbers in two different sites. I picked up the low ball number of 84. It's somewhere between 84 to 100. So let's just take it as $84. It would have grown to $840,000 or close oh, to a yeah. million dollars, right? How much did you say? Uh, 50K. 50K, right? Now in 1980, the index value was 111. Okay. Mm -hmm. In 2020, the index value is 3,756. Yeah. And it would have been giving out dividends on top of the value increase. I'll touch upon dividends uh, later in the slides. Put together, the compounding rate will be close to 12% year over year. Right. Think about it. When, what? So here is where the kicker or the magic happens. In spite of the top 10 companies no longer being top 10, and some of these companies might not even be there, how can a, an index where you haven't done anything, remember you did not even look at it for 40 years, things have grown this much. The secret sauce or the essence, again, ties back to the first session that we looked at is the power of compounding, where when you have a long period of time, 40 years is a long time right. I mean, in a human lifespan, and all you have to do is to sit quietly and let the winners continue to run. So the mm -hmm. secret essence ingredient is you need to survive. See, if the whole 500 goes for a bust, boom, it's gone. You might not have made much. But the first 500 that has been picked, there were some winners. You did not disturb it. You let it grow, grow, grow. And then as and when new companies got added, you added it and you let those winners grow. So the secret sauce is you let it survive, you let the winners grow, give itself a long period of time, then you see the magic happening. This is how an index funds work. And this is why it is extremely, extremely powerful. Okay. So right. an analogy I'll have here is uh, between 1980 top 10 and 2020 or 2021 top 10, they, they are not even the same, but still an index is an index. It is similar to the cells in our body millions of cells die and new cells come up every every i would say every every day right mm -hmm. uh, now does that mean that the human being is different because of millions and millions of cells have died out no nah. it's the same human being right mm -hmm. it's the same fundamental i mean it's an analogy so it's the same idea there some companies will die or a lot of companies will go not do anything but the few things that does well, you just sit on it. And that's it. That's where the magic happens. Questions? Uh, no, none right now. Already. Now, uh, you know, S&P 500 companies in 2099, this is a rough math. So I might be off by even 100 or $200 billion over here. But just uh, let me walk through the thought process over here. Put together these 500 companies generated $1.5 trillion in profits, net profits in 2019, okay? Yeah. Now, do you know how much revenue did these companies generate in 2019? Can you make a rough guess? I mean... Um... What's the GDP of America, 2019? We can just see if we can work back from there. Uh, what is a GDP? Uh, I mean, can I search it up? Yeah, yeah search it up. All right. Yeah, hold on. Uh, yes, you are Google. GDP. You are yeah. GDP. How much it is? Per capita or? No, no, just the total GDP. We are just looking at the overall numbers. All right. Um, 21.4 trillion. Yeah. Right. My What I did was that, again, some of these numbers that I've pulled, they are from Wikipedia. So take it with a pinch of salt, but ballparkishly, I'll be right. So S&P 500 revenue is around 14 trillion. Right, I mean, of the mm -hmm. 21 or 22 trillion, say roughly 14 trillion uh, comes to uh, come 14.5, actually say 14 to 14.5 is the revenue. And I said, these companies make 10% net profit margins. I pulled these numbers from uh, S&P report. So that's where I arrived at 1.4 to 1.5 trillion, okay? Right. Do you know how, what is the market cap of the entire S&P 500? If I have to go and buy S&P 500 today, how much should I pay? 
just google it just google s&p 500 market cap see what you get market um all right as of uh june 30th 2021 it's about uh 38 trillion dollars okay so it should be around you know my number is around 36 trillion it'll be higher than what you're quoting so the way to think about it is think about s p 500 as a machine okay Mm -hmm. The machine is generating somewhere between 1.4 to 1.5 trillion. And the machine is costing 36 trillion or 37 trillion. Okay. Right. Now, what does that mean? What is the interest rate that the S&P 500 is yielding us? Um, the interest rate, right? How do, yeah. we, cal how do we calculate that again? Yeah, put the 36 uh, trillion in the denominator. Say 36 in the denominator and say oh. one uh, one point four in the numerator. You would just say 1.4 by 36 or 37, doesn't matter. 1.6 by divided by 37? Yeah, 1.4 by 37. Just say 1.4 or 1.5 by 37. 37. What you is get it? Uh, 3.8%. Yeah, so roughly that is the interest rate. Now let's, you know, the way to th the reason I'm spending a little more time on it is very important. And uh, uh, let's connect back to the video game example that I gave uh, in that in session three. Remember, um, if I am expecting a ten percent return from something, okay? Yeah. If that something is generating ten dollars every year, how much would I pay for that? something think about the yeah, machine generating okay, so if it makes ten dollars a year yeah and i expect ten percent interest from that machine how much would i pay for that machine ten for uh oh wait isn't it that one that return on interesting yeah it's basically, yeah it's basically you know something times point one is equal to ten dollars now you all oh, right yeah pay. okay Something times 0.110. Oh, okay. Um, so it would be 10 divided by 0.1. Yeah, exactly. 100. 100, right? Now let's yeah. take you expect 5% interest. How much would you pay for that machine? Well, um, it would be 100 divided by 0.05. No, no, 10 you... divided by 0. Oh, 10, right. It's yeah. 10, yeah. Which should get uh, you what? 200. Yeah. So what's the relationship between interest rate and price? Uh, when the interest rate um, decreases, right? Yeah. The price increases because it went yep. from 100 to 200. Exactly. And the vice versa. When interest rate increases, what happens? Uh, price decreases. Correct. Now, who dictates the interest rate in the system? Remember from the previous example? Uh, the Fed? Yeah. Fed, the safest guys, the safest asset determines the interest rate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the safest thing? The 10-year treasury that you buy from the U.S. government. So you're lending money to the U.S. government. They are paying you interest and they'll pay you the principal back after 10 years. You know how much it is yielding today? How much? 1.4% roughly. Oh. Now, things can't go below that because remember, that's the safest asset. So which means things like S&P 500, there is risk in it, right? Because it's, it's, it, it, there is risk in it or that's how people perceive it. So they demand a little more or a lot more. So they are asking for an interest rate somewhere between three to 4%. I'm just, this, these are ballparkish number. That's why when you divide one by 3% or one by 4%, you get 33X or 25X. So the reason why S&P is selling at, 36 trillion or 37 trillion is nothing but this 1.5 percent let's take people want 24 percent from it because treasury is yielding 1.4 percent you just multiply by that by 25 because one by four percent is 25 you get close to 36 trillion this is how you the, this is the way to think about why certain things are selling at a certain price does it kind of make sense yeah, kind of. Are there any like visualizations to help? Yeah, no, I think the best visualization uh, is, uh, you know, maybe I'm just uh, to think about investing. I think it's going to be over here. I remember where we uh, looked at this uh, chart. 
uh, and we looked at uh, this price and interest. And along with that, I we did look at the spreadsheet of three different companies. Mm -hmm. When you go over it, you will try to kind of get a feel for it. I think it once you think a little more and work it out, you will have a good feel about why it is the way it is. Again, these are rough math. I might be off easily by 10 to 15% or maybe 20% because these are rough ballparkish math that I did. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, okay. End of the day, why are we investing in an index or any asset class? To make money, profit. Yeah. yeah, right. So what I have done is this is the driver tree for S&P 500. Uh, how does the value of the index go up? Because that's why, that's when you make money, okay? Mm -hmm. Remember I said the profits generated by S&P 500 is 1.5. That's what these profits are. Yeah. And I said people are paying 25 times to this or 30 times to this, right? Mm -hmm. That's what the multiple is, okay? Right. Now I said multiple is a function of interest rates. When I say interest rates, it's the risk-free rate from US government. Okay. Yeah. So if that goes lower, multiple goes higher, right? I mean, rate and multiple are inversely proportional. When rate go higher, multiple goes lower. Okay. Mm -hmm. And investors expectation. Oh yeah. That's like how they expect like what? Like three, four percent of interest. Yeah, that and then if there, there's euphoria, like for example, US government has been doling out money for a lot of people, maybe for the right reasons, but some of them might uh, take that money and put it in the market. And if everybody sees a stock going up, they might uh, be super optimistic and they would go and invest their money. Sometimes during recession or let's take in COVID-19, April, May, 2020, People were so pessimistic. Then they would pay lesser to this 1.5 trillion. Think about it as the mood of the investor. It swings continuously. Oh, yeah, oh yeah that makes sense. Yeah, so, so to connect it back again, remember you make money when this thing goes up, right? Mm -hmm. The function of profits and the multiple people pay. Multiple is a function of interest, uh, risk-free rate plus the risk premium that investors expect because S&P 500 is a risky asset or that's how they perceive it compared to US Treasury and the mood mm -hmm. of the investor. They are gungo, happy, whatnot. Man, I'm going to, I don't, I don't mind paying a lot. I'm going to pay whatever it takes or I'm very sad or I'm not even sure of the future as a whole. They just depress it, okay? So that's what drives this, all right? Right. Now let's look at profits. When will profits go up? When revenue go up, uh -huh. right? Yeah. When margins go up, mm -hmm. you know what a margin is? Um, I mean, I probably heard margin in probably like, like margin of error. Is it, that's probably like a different thing, right? That's a different thing. Yeah. So think about it this way. If you make hundred, if you earn a hundred dollars, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, consider a typical family, a family earns hundred dollars. Yeah. They spend 90, they save 10. Margin is $10 divided by what they earn, $100 is 10%, okay? Oh, so margin is what? Saved over spent? Yeah, in, in, in the case of company, it's profits divided by their revenue is their margin. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if the margin is greater than one, that's a good way. Profit over revenue? Profit over revenue, yeah. Margin can't be greater than one. Okay, okay. Unless what, do, know, what does the margin tell you? Margin like if yeah, how it, profitable a company is safe. Oh, enough. right. Because if it if it's much bigger, right? That means exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Make sense? Yeah. Now, how does revenue go up? Remember the Linda example? Product. Right. Yeah. If you're more productive, yeah. you make more money. Yeah, you make more. And the I'll give you an example of productivity. Uh, Linda is the one example that you can think of. And I'm going to give you another example from my childhood days. So remember, uh, my parents or your grandparents, they both worked uh, for central government. Mm -hmm. Back in those days, I used to go uh, to that office. Well, I used to work in that office, uh, but I used to go as a kid to that office uh, where there's an elevator or we call it as lift in India. Okay? Yeah. So there were four floors, right? And in India, we count, we don't say the ground floor as first floor. So it'll be like uh, actually four, which means it's five floors in the U.S., so to enter into the lift, there used to be a lift operator, okay? So mm -hmm. what does the lift operator do? He will sit inside the lift. There will be a small chair 
and he would open the lift door people come in and he will press all the buttons 1 2 3 4 and whenever the lift stops in that floor he'll open the door people get down he will do it from 10 am till 5 pm every day okay of course he will take lunch break now what happened to lifts today in india or elevators in the us it is all what automated do you see anybody operating the door no no because machines i mean you completely automated it now people who might have been doing this job it's a manual labor they are freed up to do something else okay mm-hmm. so this is how productivity comes in you automate it see remember there are 24 hours in a day that is not going to change uh, at least on this planet or maybe in, in the universe which means you would have to figure out productive ways to increase the output of goods and services and that's going to be the primary driver okay Mm-hmm. then we looked at inflation you don't do anything you just keep increasing prices when prices go up your revenue is going to go up right right and then what happens when there are more people in a place compared to you know 10 years back or 20 years back would the revenue go up or down um if there are more people yeah i mean it would go up cuz you have more workers right exactly i mean there are more people i mean more workers and there are more people buying see think about it from oh, buying like that as well, right? yeah. yeah yeah so higher the population there is a high likelihood that they are going to buy more and your revenue is going to go up so the reason i'm breaking a doll down is to kind of think through oh what are the sources of me making money if i invest in s&p 500 that's why we are doing this exercise it's an important exercise to go through okay right now let's look at margins how would margins go up the first driver is efficiency okay mm-hmm. simply if i need 100 employees okay to get something done let's take each employee i'm paying 1 dollar how much am i paying total in total 100 let's take i can somehow increase improve my efficiency and i need 50 employees now how much would i pay for those employees 50 yeah now what happens to the remaining 50 uh profit yeah that's or, it margin yeah. goes up okay now you studied uh, you know at least in in your 12th grade you studied about competition in your business class right so what happens when there's a lot of competition will you make more money or will you make less money when i say money profits i mean you'd make less money because uh consumers have a choice yeah to uh, an example could be like uh the streaming services Yeah. Like before you only had like Netflix, everyone had Netflix. Yeah. And now you got a lot of more streaming services. And I think in the US, Netflix actually like will start losing some like subscribers. Yeah, by right, right. so, as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, that's that's so which means competition, lesser the competition, higher your margins are. But competition is healthy, remember, right? Yeah, it pushes innovation because it improves productivity. See, it's like, you know, you don't want to over index on this. This will affect productivity. So they are all interlinked, okay? Mhm. Now tax rates, if tax rates are higher, will margin mm-hmm. be higher or lower? Lower. Yeah. Now remember in 2017, uh did the tax rate corporate tax rate go up or down um down yeah this was during trump era right yeah yeah it makes sense from 35% to 21% and all of a sudden the margins went up and then your s&p 500 multiple started going up as well profits went up okay mm-hmm. now debt you know when you borrow you pay interest which means your profits will come down because you are paying money to service that debt okay mm-hmm. higher the debt lower the margin lower the debt higher the margin okay now this is the source or, or you know the technical term if you go and talk to a management consultant they will call this as a driver tree just google it and see how useful it is because it helps you to take the content out of your brain and put it on a piece of paper and play around some with some of these variables any questions uh no no right now yeah this like you said this like tree is pretty helpful for explaining Yeah and this now you can you know you ask me like hey is there a way to visualize this i think this is what i yeah. should have gone to this rather than the other one but yeah it, yeah cuz it is like i felt like the explanation the previous slide was like the important part but it would have like been easier much easier to follow with this like slide showing yep. makes so. sense makes sense now there's one more piece that is not captured in the driver tree okay mm-hmm. which is this see a company right what do they do with the profits that they generate 
what do you think they are doing with the profits i mean they probably like keep some of it for themselves but most of it they probably like like use it to improve the company yeah so they reinvest it right i reinvest all right why do they reinvest well uh, i think like i just said before to like improve the company so they could like make their products better yep and then they can you know uh, differentiate uh, compared to their competition and they can more importantly they can grow right right so this part we already accounted for in this particular slide okay mm -hmm. what they don't need for today because hey look i have enough money to take care of my business to maintain my competitive uh, 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 positioning then let me redistribute or let me give back uh, the remaining profits in the form of dividends okay mm -hmm. this is also a source of your return it's not just index going up from say 100 to 200 alone is your source of return but the extra cash that the company is giving out is an important source of your income or your return okay yeah say microsoft or say apple they pay dividends every quarterly uh, it comes out to you um, so every year you get let's take depending on the share price the percentage could be 0 0.5 0 0.1 1 2 some companies might be 4% so that's one source another source is companies buy back their own shares now here is the right way to think about it imagine uh, a company is making 100 profit mm -hmm. there are three shareholders each owning one share of the company yeah and what's the total again five three shares or three in total okay yeah three shares say you own one i own one and let's take mukund owns one and maybe let's add amma owns one so that's like four shares okay yeah well no maybe let me take another example so let's take three people right a b c okay mm -hmm. uh now let's take a and b they buy out the share from c and then they redistribute it to themselves now how many shares remain sorry they buy out the shares from c and they retire those shares so there were three shares 100 dollars in profits now a and b together they bought back the shares from c now there are two shares left right yeah now what would the share of profit for a before the buyback and after the buyback for both a and b uh what was the total profit before 100 100 yeah i mean before each one would be like it would be split evenly so it would yeah. be 33 before yeah and afterwards it would be what 50 yeah now so, yeah. mm -hmm. so what yeah, increased it increased right so that's another source of your return if the multiple stays the same let's say the multiple is 10 in the previous world each share your share will be 330 in the post buy back world it will be $500 right mm -hmm. so the point i'm trying to drive is share buy backs should increase uh should contribute to your return okay yeah now i'm going to club it all together into what can one expect if they or one expect from s&p 500 remember i spoke about oh, s&p 500 generated 12% whatever numbers i told uh, a few slides back mm -hmm. you're not going to get anywhere closer if you're going to hold uh, this index for the next 30 40 50 years right right what you are going to expect is this on the lower end and higher end i'm just going to sit on the lower end first real growth productivity growth is 2% i said okay mm -hmm. inflation is 2% put together i get 4% mm -hmm. dividends is 1.5% i said so total is 5 per 5.5 and i'm saying share buybacks is zero because companies also issue shares i'm just saying together it doesn't yield anything so total i'm saying 5.5% okay yeah on the higher side all i did was added one to inflation because i'm not sure if productivity can go up higher than that maybe mm -hmm. and i said buybacks is one so somewhere between 5.5 say let's low ball it right say 5 to 7% is what one could expect from an s&p 500 over the very long term i'm talking about 40 50 years now if right. any of these numbers go down obviously those returns will go down okay mm -hmm. questions um all right i mean just connecting to the previous topic right yeah so what was that one like formula before like the return on investment was that 
Like, yeah, that's the multiple part. Yeah. So this is the part that I said, right? I mean, oh, like, yeah, yeah. No, there's a one thing like um where you could figure out like how long it would take to get your money back oh, or something. Yeah, that's 72 by N. Yeah. yeah well, what was that called? It's the rate at which how many years will it take for your money to double at X percent interest? Rate. Okay. So um yeah. let's take like this thing, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So it's what, let's just say 6% about maybe. It takes you yeah, 12 years to double. Oh. So in a 50 year holding period, um, you would get four doubles, a little over four doubles. So your dollar would be growing to say 16 to $18. All right, yeah. All right, yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so I missed out, I mean, purposefully, right? There is an element that I missed out, which will be, uh, which I'll be opening up over here, okay? Oh yeah, and yeah, I'll come to that later. Okay, now um, five to seven percent is what I said. This is on a piece of paper, but the reality is going to be very different, and that's what I'm going to talk about on this slide. Okay, mm -hmm. so the way to read this slide, uh, let me spend a minute just to focus on the legends at the bottom. Okay, mm -hmm. starting 1970. Uh, this this one, the one that starts here, this is the annualized one year annualized return. What did S and P five hundred return every year? Okay, mm -hmm. from nineteen seventy till twenty twenty. The next one, which starts over here, is five years. So nineteen seventy, seventy one, seventy two, seventy three, seventy four. That's why it starts from nineteen seventy four. Okay. Yeah, it's a five-year annualized return. So if you go to 1975, it would do five-year return from 1971 to, it's a rolling return. It's called as every five years we measure and then that's what is charted, okay? Right. The next one is a 10-year return that starts here. 15-year return, 20-year return, 25-year return. If you look at this green one, which is a 25-year return, it starts in 1994. The reason why 1994, remember 1970 to 1994 is a 25 year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Now, what do you, what, what do you, what, what are some of the takeaways can you uh, get from this slide? Well, the one year uh, return thing is like sometimes leads to the highest uh, return, but it's like very, it's like a wild card. Like yep. you, you don't know what you're going to get. Sometimes you could get like a 36% uh, return. Sometimes it could end up with like a negative 36. So that's like a wild card. But if you hold it for like a longer time, say mm -hmm. 20 or 25 years, mm -hmm. you won't reach like the heights of 36%, but you pretty much guarantee you're going to get like what? 12% around. Yeah, it's, it depends 9% to 11%, but yeah, you know, his, okay. No, I think that's the crux of this chart. I think I'm glad you pretty much got it. Uh, and you have summarized it beautifully. The wild card is uh, <laughs> the shorter the duration, the wild card it is. Actually, if you look at it, right, even on a 10 year basis, there was a period where the index returned negative returns. You know when this was, if you look at it? Look at the, the one where I'm holding. Yeah, oh, is that eight and nine? 2008 and nine. So pretty much if you have invested money in 1999, right? You started, you put some money in 1999 and you left it. The first example that I gave, you might not have made much. Uh, you would have made minus 2% uh, uh, return compounded during that 10 year period, okay? Mm -hmm. But at least in this time frame that I chose, uh, from the 15 year period onward, there are no negative returns. Again, I'll show another period where even 15 years can lead to negative returns. Any questions on this slide? Oh, uh, no, it makes sense. Because awesome. it's like, yeah, the, the longer you have your money invested for, the more guarantee you have. Yep, yep, that's pretty much the crux of it, okay? Now, moving on, uh, remember I purposefully did not talk about the multiple part when I drew the decision. I mean, I just touched upon it, okay? And mm -hmm. I said S&P will return somewhere between five and seven. But what investors were willing to pay, is it constant or is it moving up and down? Uh, it moves up and down. Why? Why does it move up and down? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm not really sure. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, because if you... Oh, wait, well, this is the multiple part. Oh, yeah, yeah it's based yeah. on the opinion of the people, right? Yeah. So sometimes, like, if you look at, um, if you look at, uh, let's say, 
like right after right before 2010 right yeah. there's like a huge uh dip yeah and if you look at um in the 40s there's also like another dip yeah right great depression yeah. um and yeah there's like a huge rise in like 2010 so probably like um everyone was more positive yeah, and no, I think, you know, one thing that we need, I need, I should have normalized this, right? See, usually what happens, this is a period where, uh, uh, what do you call it as, right? When, during a recessionary period, mm -hmm. profits will dip a lot more than revenue, okay? Because uh, because of operating leverage that a lot of companies has, 10% uh, dip in revenues might result in a much more dip in profits, so these multiples can move up and down. So there's an element of noise in this chart, but you pretty much captured the essence of what is going on. Let's take, uh, there were periods uh, where uh, people were willing to pay over here, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, five times earnings. And there were periods over in 99, 2000, where people were willing to pay uh, a much higher earnings, maybe like 30 or 40. There is aberration, even this 45-ish is a little on the higher side, I would say, because earnings are a lot more depressed compared to the revenue, okay? Now, one other pattern that you should see here, I think two things, one, this will move around up and down a lot, especially on a shorter duration, it's going to be violent as you saw over here, okay? Mm -hmm. But, Another trend that you see, if you look at time till 2000 and then time after, you know, 2010 and 2020, interest rates are at all time lows. Government has been reducing the interest rates. When interest rates are low, multiples are high. They are inversely proportional. So asset prices have gone up a lot and that is in a way reflected in this earnings, right? So those are the two key takeaways here. Now, let me talk about a specific point, which is nicely captured in this chart compared to this chart, where you saw a dip over here. Mm -hmm. There's somebody putting their money, uh, for example, say someone uh, during 99, 2000 January, uh, the value of the index was 1492, okay? In right. March 2009, do you know what the value of the index was, the lowest value, roughly? Uh, March 2009. Yeah. Uh, what do you say it was in 2000 again? 1492. 1492. So, I mean, in uh, the 2009, we could probably look at the 10-year thing. Yeah, no, just make a guess. All right. I mean, it's, it's around like 3% less than the 1492. Well, so. yeah, no, see, compounded returns are going to be very different. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thinking simple all right so that yeah. doesn't work all right then plus, I'll... yeah plus remember these charts are done over a year and i'm talking about a particular point in time in march 2009 where it was at all time push um was 770 oh seven, yeah that's so a... basically 52 percent of the value on paper is wiped out mm -hmm. okay 52 percent down after what nine or ten years okay so this is something to keep in mind, but there's one thing that uh, I wanted to touch upon. That's why I'm stressing this particular period. You're not going to invest once in your lifetime. Remember you are what, 18 years now? Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about investing as a game. You should play for 50, 60, 70 years. You're going to invest every month. Okay. Right. You invest every month. What happens, right? Sometimes some months or some years you might pay high. Some years you might pay low, okay? Mm -hmm. So hopefully you're going to average out that over a very long period, okay? So the model that I wanted to say, or the, the point I wanted to share is dollar cost average your investments. Never try to time it by catching, oh, I'm going to catch the bottom. Nobody knows what the bottom, where the bottom is. I'm going to, oh, the market is at the top or it's going to continue going up. Nobody knows if it will continue going up. It might crash next week or the week after. But if you have been buying, let's say you started in 1950s, right? I'm just making it up. And then you have been investing all the way till 2000. You might have bought at some highs. You might have bought at some lows here, some lows here, some highs here. You have been, you would be, overall, you might be buying at different periods in time. 
hopefully you might reduce the impact of the multiple remember the driver tree that i spoke see we don't control it the market controls it interest rates and mood of the people i'm just focusing on the revenue the margins and the whole us economy is it going to be productive is the world economy going to be productive so let me neutralize it or minimize the impact of this multiple to the best possible extent and the only way that i can think of doing is to dollar cost average or if you're in india you rup- rupee cost average over a long period of time make sense mm-hmm. questions uh no all right now here's another kicker to you okay i was like you know i i couldn't believe the slide uh, when i looked at this number so the source is from putnam uh, so this example from 2005 december till 2020 okay mhm the uh okay uh the total returns generated by the index is close to 10% okay yeah your 10000 would have become 41000 what does it mean by say fully invested basically you start uh start at that particular time oh okay yeah, just yeah just ignore the word fully invested there right so just say you are invested you put your money on that particular day and then you wake up on uh, 31st december 2020 end of day your mm-hmm. portfolio will be up by 41000 if you are in- invested 10000 dollars okay yeah now let's say you missed the best 10 days out of how many days um i mean it's in 15 years so yeah, it's like you know a lot 1500 ish days to be uh, uh yeah you know if you miss the best 10 days mm-hmm. yeah, your portfolio will be only 18800 oh wow think about it for a minute okay and you know how what percentage is 10 days out of this 5500 ish days what are the well, odds of you picking those 10 days in 5500 days definitely less than a percent yeah it's like we 1 in 500 0.2% roughly right yeah so the moral of the story is time in the market is more important than timing the market mm mm-hmm. okay i mean who can predict those best 10 days or maybe it doesn't matter best best 20 best 30 but all i'm saying is few days matter a lot more lot 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 more than what we think so this is why when people tell me like oh this election is coming should i sell all my investments and stay on the sidelines and reenter i have not, i mean i never did that and i started buying index funds in 2006 uh it's been what 16 years now uh, since i've been investing you know how many stocks i would have sold in the 16 years or how many times i would have sold no how much yeah. i have never sold any so oh. I've, yeah, i've just been i have never sold a single index uh, in my in in the last 16 years never once have wait I, you, you never sold indexes but you yeah. sold like normal stocks before, yeah i would have right? sold yeah. them before. i've done but never touched my index for 16 years now i've seen yeah but isn't like the index like s&p 500 just like a representation of the us as a whole like That's the right. us economy yeah yeah it is so there'll be no reason to sell as long as the us isn't in some like downward spiral to like you know destruction yeah but it's mean again i would that's just, a very low chance yeah right exactly now. basically that's the whole idea right you want to survive for 50 long years okay yeah all right now okay now every asset class has this day remember i said there is no 15 year period where uh, stock returned or uh, negative returns right mm-hmm. well it's not 15 it's like getting close now let's go through each uh, this is the time frame returns from the stocks from bonds and cash and this is inflation because remember everything should be seen through inflationary lens and not on its own during the 1928 to 1941 period which asset class did best based off of this uh, slide uh bonds right yep because it's greater than inflation and it's greater than everything else what about 42 to 68 uh stocks what about 69 to 77 uh inflation yeah when <laughs> nothing came close i think you would have been better with cash surprisingly what about 78 to 99 stocks 2000 to 2008 bonds What about two thousand nine to twenty? Uh, stocks. Two thousand 
Yep. No, initially I had this as every asset class had as it did. Every dog has it. Wait, so <laughs> if wait, so if the US isn't like a bad time, yeah. is it better to buy bonds? Because like in the two times bonds came out on top, yeah. It's okay. yeah, it's, it's between like um the Great Depression and um at the start of you know the crash kind of. Yeah, so okay, here's the key uh, takeaway, a few key takeaways. One, uh, this is a 93 year history, okay? Yeah. Just because we have data for 93 years doesn't mean that the future is going to play out as it is shown here. It could be very different and more likely than not, it could it will be very different. All the past is going to tell, especially in the financial markets are, you cannot predict the future, but you can measure the risk or you can at least think about the risk that you are getting into. That is all this. Oh, thing. right. So, yeah, yeah, like bonds and cash are never like negative. Yeah, well, but, but um, look at it from an inflationary angle, right? I mean, cash lost every year except one period or every period except one period. Oh, so, oh yeah, in that terms, yeah. Yeah, so the key here is this. Uh, use this as a guide to understand risk, which is one. Two, bond should be in your portfolio as a stabilizer. You never know, right? People will say like, look, the interest rates are going to go up. Bonds will crash. Sure. But why not have 10% in bonds, 5% in bonds, some exposure to bonds so that there are periods where stocks might not do anything. Maybe the next 10 or 15 is going to be that. Maybe bonds, maybe, you know, that's where diversify it a little more is the point that I'm trying to convey through this. Okay. Right. All right, now the next question that you might ask me is this. Oh, you know what, what the hell, right? 5%, 4%, what kind of a return am I going to get from an index? Why not I invest, uh, pick a fund manager, or these are money managers, they do this full time to pick stocks for me, or why don't I go and pick my own stocks, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the natural next question one would ask. And sure, one can do that. But before that, understand the records and then we can talk about that okay now uh, this is a study so spiva spiva stands for s p 500 index versus active funds so you know the s p 500 index so mm -hmm. they publish uh, a semi-annual report so twice a year they publish this report comparing yeah. how the fund managers did active managers did compared to a dumb index okay Mm -hmm. That is, I can go and buy a fund run by a guy who is picking stocks or a guy or a girl or run by a person who is picking stocks, okay? Right. Or I have a choice of buying an index. All the study does is compare these two things, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I said every semi-annual they did. So I pulled their 2018 report, 2019 report, 2020 report. I charted it. So they do a one-year comparison, three-year, five-year, 10-year, 15-year, 20-year. Okay, only in 2020 report, they had a 20 year study. That is, they have a track record running back uh, for the last 20 years comparing uh, PASU or index funds versus active funds. Now, if you look at it, right, let's pick uh, 2018, the green mm -hmm. one, because that's the first one. In the first year, one year returns, if you look at index funds outperformed 60 close to 68 percent or 70 percent of active fund managers okay oh active funds are people like um the money managers something yes. right yeah, yeah. did better than 68 percent in the first year indexes did better than 80 plus percent in the third year it mm -hmm. did better than 87 percent in the fifth year it did better than around same 85 and then it did close to better than 90% of uh, the fund managers that outperformed in a 15 year period. Okay. Right. Now, just by looking at that trend, you can infer two things. Index funds have outperformed most of the fund managers. Number one, number two, as the time horizon increases again, right? There's no study in 2018, 19, that is dating back beyond 20, uh, 20 15 years. 2020, they had for 20, again, right, 80, 85 plus percent, they are underperforming. And this is across all domestic funds. 
small cap, mid cap, large cap. If you look at large cap alone, indexes will be outperforming even more. The point is this, the longer the time horizon is, let's say you're talking about a 50 year period or a 60 year period, I don't even know which fund manager or which, which actively managed funds can come closer outperforming a dumb index. Is that mm-hmm. clear? Yeah. Okay. Now you can, uh, another, another, another stat, right? Which I'll tell you, which is, uh, which is in a superb study. Uh, I forget his name. Let me give me a second. Um, what is this guy's name is? Hold on for a second. Oh yeah. Hendrik Bess, Bessem Binder, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. So he did a study. Okay. Yeah. The study goes this way. He looked at, um, uh, the period from 1926 to 2016. It's a 90 year period, okay? Mm -hmm. He looked at 26,000 stocks that were in that database. These are public uh, companies, 26,000, okay? Yeah. He just looked at what percentage of those companies are responsible for wealth creation. I mean, we spoke about index going up from here to there. What percentage of those 26, thousand companies are responsible for all the wealth that got created. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here is the mind blowing stats. Let's look at the first stat. This one you hear, these are the number of firms and these are the returns generated by uh, the firms. What do you, what do you infer from this chart? The left one, the orange one. Um, The number of firms, what does the Y axis represent? Cumulative cumulative wealth generated by these uh, companies and yeah and yeah and how does it go above 100 percent? like if it goes above 100 percent, what does that mean yeah that's a good question i don't know what does it mean if it goes above 100 it has to peak at 100 i don't know what does it mean uh, to go above 100 that's a good question i don't know all right um look at the look at the 50 percent. you know just from here what what Percentage of companies are responsible for 50% of wealth creation. Oh, uh, it's not like very little of them. Do you know how many are they? Um, Just make a guess. Of 26,000, if you have to put a number, what would that be? All right. 50%. All right. Uh, 50% of wealth. Yeah. I will guess 40 companies. Yeah, you're, you're there. I think 87 companies. Oh, 87. Okay. <laughs> That's be one, one third of 1%. Think about it for a minute one third of 1% of the companies generated 50% of the wealth. Mm -hmm. And 4% of the companies represented, uh, generated one, uh, sorry, 100% of the wealth. All right. The rest of them, you just round it to zero. So 96%, that's why you see a dip here. I know why the dip is back to 100. Because once you reach this mark, that mark is 1,100 companies where the wealth creation is equal to 100%, okay? Oh, okay. So that's what it is. Now that's why it dips over here. I don't know what uh, it means. Maybe, you know, the way to look at it is, okay, I think I get it. As the number of companies go up, there are some positive players here. So the, the total wealth goes up, but they are dragged down by companies over here. They are dragging you down, 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 back to 100. So this is what this 96% where, you know, if you say this is 4%, 1,100, rest of the 96%, there are some positive, some negative, but put together, they are zero. Does it make sense? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So so what, what do you infer from this? Is it easy to go and beat an index just from the stats? Uh, no. Yeah. All right. Okay. So this is what, right? Buffett in his, uh, in the recent AGM annual general meeting, he said uh, it is not as easy as it sounds because, and the reason for that is uh, so many people are betting uh, the whole uh, GameStop saga, the AMC saga and whatnot, right? I mean, people have, uh, they can do whatever they want to do, but he wanted to uh, say why it is not as easy as people think like, oh, you can, anybody can come and buy a stock and become a millionaire that is something uh, that is not going to happen in most cases, okay? Mm -hmm. Now he used a brilliant example. He took the top 20 companies from 1989, okay? Yeah. And what do you see from this? How many companies are from Japan that are from the top 20? 
Um, more than fifty percent. Yeah, sixty-five percent of them are from uh, Japanese companies. Mm. US is four of them. And what kind of companies are they? A lot. Uh, of- bank, 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 power. Yeah. Motor, uh, car, mm-hmm. security, uh, steel, bank. Yeah, mostly banks, like industrial stuff. Yep. This is twenty twenty one. How many from Japan? I don't see any. Okay. How many from US? Um. More than fifty percent. Is it yeah, the same? Oh, yeah. Damn. <laughs> and then they are all what tech companies. Yeah. What's yeah. Uh, the Saudi Arabia one? Is that it's like oil? Yes. That's the yeah, oil of course. Company. Yeah. That's the oil company there. Yeah. So there's Saudi Arabia, China is there. Four from it's pretty much what having three from China. Uh, they are tech companies, and one is an alcohol company, the yeah. Mount Mount I. Um, but but one from France and one from Taiwan, and Taiwan is also electro means semiconductor, right? TSMC. Yeah, Korea. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so Samsung, right, Android. Uh, so, so yeah, so he said, look, I think if a person from the 1989, right, it would have been obvious to say like, go big on Japan, right? It's going to be the future. And I'm sure there would be a bunch of magazine that would have said like, hey, go big on Japan. It's going to be fascinating. But you sit in 2021, the world looks very different. The companies look very different. But if you are an index fund investor and imagine you're holding an world index, you can even buy a world index. It would have looked like this, possibly assuming that these are public companies. And in 2021, it would have looked like this. You would have done really, really well. Now imagine you are an individual investor trying to pick winners. What are the chances of you unlearning all the oil and all the industrial companies and continuously relearning and migrating into this thing? It's not impossible. There are people who do that. But it's very, very difficult. That's why I'm saying the core should be a part of or should be in an index. Um, any questions here? Uh, no, I mean, uh, we looked at a similar example before where yeah. you, there were mostly tech companies. So yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And here's another thing. We are our own worst enemies. And even I said indexing, you just go sit on it. People don't do that because we are our own worst enemies. There's another study uh, done by a company where it compared the returns earned by the index, compared it with the return earned by an average investor. What do you see from this? So this is a one-year return, three-year return, again, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, for the period ending 31st December 2019. Uh, 2019. What do you see from this? Uh, the average investor made less than the index. Yep, actually, right. You know how much less they made? Uh, I'm just uh, recollecting. I think... Uh, uh, S&P earned around 10% and the average investor earned 5%, roughly half of that. Remember, half of that in percentage terms in compounding is massive, mm-hmm. right? So the reason why they earn that much is they cannot uh, sit quietly when there is storm. So, so even though I said, oh, this is very easy, you can do that, uh, not many people can do that. There will be countless reasons to sell. And uh, so this is an, uh, tell, I mean, this is an excellent chart of the index from 2008 to 2020. Okay. Mm-hmm. So here it shows where S&P 500 dipped. The biggest dip happened uh, in 2008. It went down almost by 57%. And the number of days that uh, the recession lasted was 517 days. Probably that was mega brutal. The next big one was 33, I mean, 33.9 or 34%. Remember, this was between March and April. Mm -hmm. But the good news is it was short-lived. Just one month in, boom, things bounced back and it went way beyond what was uh, the previous highs, okay? The key is this. It is not being cool when things are going up. It's very easy to keep your cool in this direction but you will be tested and every investor will be tested during the times when things are falling like a roller coaster on the downside. Those who can hold their nerves, they are going to get the market returns. Those who cannot, believe me, they're not going to get anywhere closer to even half of what the market has returned, okay? Mm -hmm. One brilliant example, which I got from this book called as The Psychology of Money, between 1900 to 2019, okay, 1900 to 2019, imagine an investor named Sue. 
Yeah. All she does is she invests one dollar every month. No matter what happened, nineteen hundred to till date. There were fourteen twenty eight months during this hundred and twenty years. Mm-hmm. Okay, or hundred and nineteen years. Uh, how much would she have made? All she did was buy every month, put one hundred one dollar. Okay, she made four hundred and thirty five thousand dollars. Okay, oh, well, from one dollar. From uh, one dollar mm-hmm. every month. So technically, she had put in one. Uh, you know 1428 dollars and that is like 435000 dollars okay mm-hmm. now next come a guy named jim i mean it's a hypothetical example by the way a guy named jim he will also do the same thing 1 dollar every month except he will not put money during recession okay yeah he will wait out sit on the sidelines and then he'll reenter or he'll come back right i mean he'll sell he'll sit on cash he'll come back okay Mm-hmm. So basically, oh, there's recession. He knows he's selling, and then he is coming back into the market after the recession. So he made two fifty seven k, fifty nine, fifty four. Uh, sorry, fifty four, fifty nine percent of what uh, Sue made. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now the third person, Tom, he will also do the same as Jim, except he will sit a little bit during recession, and after that he panics and sells. and then he'll wait a little more after the recession is over so that his mind becomes peaceful and then he gets back into the market so his return was around 235k uh, which is what 54% uh, of uh, what you made so the point here is of the 1428 months 300 months or 21% of the time there were recession mm-hmm. one needs to keep their cool during those 21% of the times right roughly right. people say history says you know two thirds of the time the market goes up and the remaining one third is where you need to deal with uh, whatever you need to deal with it is during those times uh, that one needs to keep their cool i thought this is a brilliant line from morgan housel he wrote this book the psychology of money you want to read this out loud uh your success as an investor will be determined by how much you respond to punctuated moments of terror not the year spent on cruise control yeah makes sense yeah all right finally right before we conclude uh right off positions mentally uh so sometime back i met an investor from india he's an accomplished investor uh and he had this habit of let's say if his portfolio is worth 100 dollars he mentally sees it as 20 dollars Mm-hmm. He doesn't see it as hundred, and I asked him like, why does he do that? He does it so that when the market correction happens by fifty or sixty or whatever percent, he is okay with that because he's never counting that as one hundred. He is just mentally playing a game, saying that hey, this is only twenty percent or twenty dollars. So that's how he has trained his mind so that he can stay calm when there is storm in the markets. Okay. Mm-hmm. the other person from uh, you know his name is uh, seneca uh, who is a roman statesman and a, who was a roman statesman and a philosopher and who happened to be the wealthiest person in europe he had the same habit of mentally writing of position so when he travels in a ship he would travel as if uh, the ship got wrecked maybe with with one blanket with him and he would sleep on the floor why would a wealthy person do that it's kind of playing a trick to your mind if something happens badly hey i'm playing a game in my mind i'm mentally prepared to deal with it so writing of positions mentally is an excellent mental trick uh, which i want you to think about it's not like i'm advising you to do that or play that just think through that and maybe right these things will come to you maybe not today sometime in the future any questions uh no makes sense Yeah. All right. Three books. Um you know the first two predominantly covered what we looked at today. The third one, see in spite of me talking about index funds, I think there is a lot of value in studying businesses, understanding how businesses work. And this book, uh the reason I like this book a lot is it doesn't get into financial statement analysis too much which i think a lot of people spend most of their time on it 
i think that time is not well spent instead understanding what customer problems a business is solving who are the customers why are they buying those products why is this business differentiated compared to another business understanding that is extremely useful because remember any economy or any country business is the life blood right so studying that is very important at least from that angle two if you want to start your own company or even if you are going to work for a company it's a good idea to understand their business so that you can add a lot more value you can align yourself with the business strategy better more than anything and the last one if it interests you and if there are some companies that you really love using their products and you enjoy reading about them maybe you can buy some of them right remember the optionality the 87 companies that i said they generated enormous amount of wealth if you get lucky maybe why not expose yourself to that luck it's called as playing optionality from that angle i think it makes a ton of sense to study business other than that hey i'm going to bet do this uh, whatever right as a game what not i'll leave it to you to decide how you want to play the game i think next up what we will uh, do vibhu is uh, why don't you pick some companies that is of interest let's go through them just understand at a very high level what makes this business tick what problems are they solving for customers why are customers enjoying their products etc etc questions uh no all right all right done then all right cool thank you yep bye bye